Hello and a very warm welcome to the first episode of Season 3 of the Rugby Paper Podcast. We are beginning our build-up to the Rugby World Cup 2023 and we're doing so by running down the prospects and preparations of each of the major nations. This week we are starting with Italy and we are doing so with the help of their fly half and the second ever guest on the Rugby Paper Podcast, Tommy Allen. It's good to be back for me after a month off personally. Uh, yeah. A wonderful Wimbledon Tennis Championships and the podcast has had a fortnight break itself after several of us were away last week so apologies for the lack of episode last week um we're starting a new season today we sort of begin our run up to the world cup season three each episode or most of the episodes will be dedicated to the prospects and the preparations of a major world cup nation today we're starting with italy and to help us do that we have the return of the second ever guest on the rugby paper podcast in fly half and fullback now as well tommy allen how are you tommy it's good to see you Hello, it's nice to be back. Uh, yeah, it feels good. Feels good. It's uh, we've had a few few weeks of preparation now. It's yeah, we kind of can't wait to get going now with the games because preseason is a bit too long now. Uh, it'll be nice to just actually do some rugby matches instead of just running around the field uh, in the in the heat. When was your first training camp session? How long have you been in? Uh, our first training camp session. So the boys started on the fifth of June. Um, I only joined them on the. 18th of June um, so it's yeah it's not been the longest but it's been very intense we had a few few days with the army as well up in the mountains uh yeah it's it's been good but yeah we just want to get started now with, with the game probably so much better than, than yes yeah. training raring to go by this point let's talk about you first. Yeah. is fitness body everything feeling are you feeling in fairly tip top yeah I feel really good actually I've had, I had Six weeks off after the end of the season. Unfortunately, didn't make the playoffs, uh, but it gave me an extra couple of weeks of uh, of holiday, which I needed uh, since I hadn't really I had a I've had a full on two seasons now. So it was nice to give the body a bit of a rest. Like I I came back in in preseason like I felt a couple of years younger. Uh, I'm not getting any younger, but I felt a lot younger when I got into into preseason. Uh, and it's been, it's been going really well. I feel physically, I feel perfect. Um, I've gained a bit of muscle. Um, but, uh, no, I feel I feel in top shape at the moment, honestly. What's brought about the size gain? Is that um, a- uh, just uh, the change of gym program. Uh, we got a new SNC coach, uh, George Pantacost from from Wasps, and then now he's in in America. But he joined us uh, for for this for this World Cup, and he's brought a lot. Of nice insights, he's got a new program, and I think the boys are loving it. A lot of power, a lot of uh, speed work as well going on. So I think it's it's a it's a breath of fresh air for the lads, and everybody's enjoying it. I think, yeah, it's, it's brought quite a few gains in the whole team. You've had a fairly well good year. Obviously, you stayed away from Italy this time when we were calling you eighteen months ago, or you were you'd taken a step back, came back in, etc. But Injury and fitness wise, apart from well, you got slightly hit hard by Manu Tuolangi um earlier this year. But other than that, you're you're fit and uh, Ollie Lawrence maybe moji moji you slightly in the Six Nations as well. But other than that, uh, you're fairly okay, yeah. Yeah, the Ollie one was uh, just I was hoping for some support from my teammates. So honestly, <laughs> uh, I tackled him like five six times before that. And yeah, I know. That's a little bit, you can't. right. Uh, something, something, something's wrong with the uh, with your support. If that, if that's the case. Uh, now, yeah, I've, I've been rich, like, injury free. The, the season before was a lot tougher. Had a few uh, had a shoulder injury and a concussion and stuff. So it was a lot nicer to to get a run of games, especially with Quins. And then uh, I had a run of games with Italy as well. I felt like I played well in the this whole season. Um, yeah, so I think. Individually, I feel in a good place at the moment, kind of leading up to the World Cup. Yeah, I think that's been very, very noticeable. Obviously, we've known for a while now that you were saying goodbye to Quinns at the end of this season. Um, I think it was December. You may have known earlier, obviously, that you, you're you're going yeah. back to Perpignan. Um, how did you feel? Sort of, was that a personal decision? Can you talk about it a little mm-hmm. bit? How are you feeling about closing the Quinns chapter and reopening the Perpignan chapter? Yeah, well, obviously, I, I owe a lot to Quinns. They they took me in when it was quite a tough tough period for me personally. They they gave me a new love for rugby. Um, when I came in, that 
there's a new environment, new coaches, new new players, and I absolutely loved it. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. It, it's it's been good two years two years with them, but um, I felt like I wanted to go back into into French rugby. I wanted to uh, start more matches as well. Obviously, having Marcus in front in front of me, um, it's always going to be tough. Um, I always I always push myself, I always push them, but he's a, he's also a great player, and yeah, fair enough that he that he starts all the games because he's he's a he's a superstar. Um, so I wanted to go back as well just to start the important games. I wanted to play play more regularly, um, and I, I felt really good in in Perpignan on the lifestyle choice as well with my family and playing in the south of France. I think. Um, yeah, there's not much better than that, honestly. Um, and then the team that they recruited for for next season looks like a, a very, very, very good team. So I think we can we can do something interesting uh, in the next season. We'll, we'll make a few shots, in, in my opinion. Tommy, do you still see yourself as a as a fly half, as a ten? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm a fly you very much. So you were just filling in at fifteen, were you, on occasion last season? Um, yeah, I can I can play there. Um, I've got the. It doesn't change too much the way we play in Italy, especially. It doesn't change too much if you're ten or fifteen. But yeah, that's that's. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fly half. I, I don't know. If, if I have to play fifteen, I'll play. But it's not really my preferred position. So with Italy, that means you go up against Paolo Gabizzi for selection at ten. Uh, so will one or you know the alternative to to not starting is to play either twelve or fifteen. So is that still on? on the cards if if you don't get the nod at 10? Yeah, well, I'm pushing for to start at 10, honestly. Uh, I feel like I, 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 can, I can do that. I'm not... Uh, competition is good, obviously. If you need an interna- especially at international level. If you don't have competition, it means that there's something wrong with the, with the depth of the squad. So and I'm happy about uh, about the competition, but I, I do feel like I, I can be starting for Italy at far. Um, if that, that doesn't happen, we'll see what Kieran wants to do. Um, yeah. But I'd love to start for Italy, um, whether it be 10, 12, 15, hopefully 10. Um, but yeah, I, that's all I want to do is get the starting go for Italy. And actually, the other way of looking at it is, of course, Paolo played a lot of rugby at 12 uh, as well. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. options either way. Yeah, there's a lot of options. We've got a lot of good players. I know Kieran likes to see, wants to put the best, best team he can. Uh, on the field, and uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what he comes up with. Uh, we've got four warm-up games now, so we'll see what's what the different combinations he plays around with, and then uh, yeah, come the World Cup, we'll, we'll see what what he decides. And any yeah. idea what plans are off for Paolo Odogu? What position is he being considered in? I don't. Sorry, I lost you there with internet. Sorry, what, what position is Paolo Odogu being looked at? Um, now he's declared uh, officially. Yeah, he, I, he had a he had a bit of he had a stints on the wing at a stint at 13 so I think he's, he's looking at both positions there's no there's no real decisions made just yet I think everybody's trying to give an overall like an over, overview of, of, of their of their skill set so I think here as well is trying to look at players in different positions just to see if, come the World Cup what uh, what best players we can put on the field at the same time Can you yeah. tell us a little bit um, about uh, Tommy about the uh, the training with the Italian Army and yeah. where Whereabouts? Whereabouts were you? Were you up in the uh, the Northern Lakes? Um, we were up in uh, Corvara, um, so the in the Dolomites, uh, about two two thousand two hundred meters. Um, right. There's like a, there's a big army base there, a very very renowned army base of the Alpini, which is the mountain army. Yeah. Um, yeah, we went there for three nights. Uh, it was it was tough. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, we walked a hell of a lot. I think we walked around all up 45, 40, yeah, 45, 46 kilometers in two days. Okay. Um, up and down. You think the uphill is the toughest, but it's actually the downhill that's the toughest because it's just all uh, the feeling your knees and the tendons and stuff just pulling because like you need to break and stuff. So that was tough. Uh, we did a bit of, uh, we slept in the tent for, for a night. Which was quite fun, actually. Uh, we, we had a lot of stories from the different, uh, uh, lieutenants and, and and stuff, which some some of them were in the special forces back in the day. So it's quite cool to to hear the stories from them and and how they 
how they they went through the war and and all those things, um, which just must have been tough away from their families as well. Yeah, and uh, and then we worked a little bit on our leadership, decision making, under pressure, and and teamwork. So a bit of a mix. Uh, it was very tough, um, but we got through it at the end. Um, no one, no, in, no injuries. No one fell off. No mountains. Uh, luckily, we all made it through. Yeah, and this move to Perpignan, you looking forward to playing behind a pack with Pasolo to Ilagi in it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I saw I saw him play a few times this, this year, and then in my twenties, I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm happy as in my team, and not against me." Honestly, Fair. there's been there's been quite a few like good good recruits um, in the whole the whole the whole team as well. So I'm really excited. It's 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 a weird it's a weird one because obviously I'm away now until October November. So like they they've been doing their preseason and stuff, and I'm only going to get there and. Um, already missing three or four games in the top 14. Uh, so it's going to be a bit of a weird one. Luckily, I know a few players there uh, and a few of the coaches. But, um, yeah, um, I've, I've met a few of them in June um, when I went there to have a look. And uh, I think I'm going to go there again in August just for a week when I've got a week off just to, just to say hi to the boys. And, yeah. and, just, um, and so I'm not a complete stranger when I do get there in, uh, in October, November. How's your spoken French? Is it a bit rusty? Nah, it's actually good. I've got a few friends who's here on the team as well, which I which I'm uh, I'm speaking with. Uh nah, it's 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 going pretty well, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. I, I haven't really forgotten it. It's quite similar to Italian, so Yeah, of course. If if I if I don't know a word, I'll just say it in Italian, just put a French accent into it. And usually <laughs> usually it works. Usually it's uh, it's spot on. Did you learn any Catalan while you were there the first time? I uh, I didn't, uh, but a lot, of, I know a lot a lot of the moves are, are called in Catalan. So are they? I need to get yeah. I need to uh, I need to understand. I need to start learning that as well. Now I've got way too many languages. I've got to learn Turkish. My wife's Turkish, and my son's starting to learn Turkish now as well. So I can't be a uh, proper polyglot. Yeah, and I, I need to start. Yeah, I need to start. Got any Afrikaans as well? Yeah, back in Zwolinga. I learned a little bit when I was down in uh, Western yeah. Province. Uh, yeah, I did learn a bit. I can understand it uh, when the boys speak. Speaking it is a bit tough, uh, but I do, I do, I do get by a little bit. <laughs> That's very impressive. No, I, um, I was working at the Wimbledon Championships, and I'm, I'm learning Italian. I'm not going to try in front of you, but I. <laughs> yeah. did, did you know Yannick Sinner? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I well, I was interacting with him because I was taking him to his interview. So I tried the odd Italian oh, or whatever with him. Oh, my. Yeah, it was, it was quite scary, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yeah, he had a good tournament as well. He's a really cool guy, though, Yannick. Really cool. Yeah. Um. Right. Let's look ahead to Scotland very, very briefly. I just wanted to ask, like, is from your point of view, obviously, with your family, is it always that little bit different playing against Scotland, or to you at this stage, is it just a, is it just another game? Uh, yeah, I get asked this quite a lot. I, honest, I, when it started, when I started my my international career ten years ago, I probably would have said, "Yeah, it's it's a different game. Like it's um, playing against the team that helped me develop um, when I was a youngster, and then playing against a lot of my old teammates. Um, it's yeah, it's it's always special. Uh, it's always it always hits different. Uh, now it. Uh, it's I've had it so many times now that I think it's just yeah. another game. Obviously, it's it, it's always nice playing in Murrayfield, um, in front like in front of the Scottish fans and hearing the Flower of Scotland during like during during the, the anthems in in Murrayfield is always special. I think it's special for anyone who plays, but obviously I've got a bit of a link to that as well. So it's always nice. That's always nice. But once the whistle blows, it's not really there's no no different than any other game. Yeah. 100%. And we're just going back to the sort of fly half fullback debate in terms of, well, I presume you would rather feature a fly half this weekend, but given Capuazzo's injury troubles, I, I'm not 100% clear on how he is at the moment, but is the plan B you at fullback as it was in the Six Nations? Um, yeah, maybe. There's a there's another couple of players that can cover a fullback as well. Um because so I used to a debutant, so as in a potential debutant, um, who, who's made the 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 forty the forty man squad now, uh, Lorenzo Pani, who's a who's a youngster playing for Zebra, who's also a very good uh, fullback, I think. Um, so I think yeah, like I said before, Kieran's just having a look at the different options that he's got. Um, 
because you're always going to get injuries during the World Cup. It doesn't, like, even if they're not, not at the moment, they might happen later. So it's always nice to plan ahead and understand, okay, these players can play in different positions. And uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a few partnerships and a few different uh, position swaps during the, the next four games because obviously we're going to use them as a build-up to, to what's really the main objective, which is the World Cup. Yeah. Have you guys been keeping a close eye on the under twenties as well? I saw that speech from I don't well, forgive my pronunciation, David Odiasi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we've been keeping an eye on that. Then struggled a little bit uh, against Georgia and Fiji, uh, but yeah, we we knew they weren't gonna like it was that um, relegation game, which is always a stressful game. We we had full confidence that they weren't gonna get relegated. But it's always a tough game. It's a tough game to play, and there's a lot of pressure. Um, no, I know there's a few, there's a, a few good youngsters that uh, are coming through. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's it's tough to go from winning against the Springboks to then losing against uh, Georgia and, and, and Fiji. Um, so I'm sure that's mentally that would have, they might have made them stronger. It uh, might have helped them um, just understand that every game is a tough game. Um, you can't take any any game easy um and yeah hopefully they can they can develop and then yeah we'll, we'll see a few of them in the like upcoming years with the first team yeah 100 percent. can i ask about the the draw the the group obviously you've got new zealand who you haven't played since 2021 if i'm not mistaken uh yeah. you've got france who you obviously ran very close in the six nations how has that affected preparation if at all obviously it's not necessarily the kindest group to have yeah um of course it's not but none of the groups are easy um look at scotland groups scotland's group as well it's a it's a very tough group um yeah we obviously we focus our, our first well we're going to focus on these warm-up games but our first two matches are equally as important we've got uh start off in namibia and then uruguay so that's that's our main target at the moment is just to finish that those two games off, um, get a get some good good results in that, and then build some momentum. Obviously, um, then leading up to to the second two games, which are which are Fran uh, New Zealand and France. I think France is the last game. Um, I know France and New Zealand play uh, each other first in the, in the World Cup, so that that'll change a lot as well. A lot of perspectives, a lot of extra pressure for, for who loses, I guess. And and we drew to New Zealand in the World Cup last uh, four years ago. So <laughs> <laughs> anything can happen. Uh, but yeah, no, we, we ran France close in the in the Six Nations. We are probably unlucky not to get the win there. Um so we know we can we can France up against uh against the best teams. I feel like France is probably one of the best teams in the world, if not the best. Um so yeah, we're 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 confident. We're quietly confident. Uh, we just need to get these first few games out out the way first, and then we can focus on those ones. But yeah, anything can happen in the World Cup. But hopefully, we can we can make a few upsets. So, yeah, it's it's quite a tricky plan. one, though, isn't it, Tommy? Because you know, what one fantastic, you know, one-off victory against either France mm -hmm. or New Zealand, and you stand a very good chance. Except mm -hmm. that you've got to assume. That you've got you've got to pile on the points in those first two matches because exactly. there'll be two teams on three wins probably in that pool. So if you ch do choose to sort of use the squad and put a squad team out, perhaps in one of those earlier matches, you've still got to maximise the score and you've got to go for a, a big win in both those matches. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I think that's why we said we're going to focus on the first two games. That that's the first block of the of, of our World Cup. That's our first block and. Uh, Luckily now, there's no five-day turnarounds anymore in the World Cup. We have a seven-day turnaround. So we can field our, our strongest team. Well, that depends on what Kieran wants to do, obviously. But we can field our best team up against both uh, Namibia and Uruguay. You don't have to rotate as much because you do get those seven days, sometimes eight days of yeah. rest uh, to, to prepare for the next game. So, um, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a... It's going to be tough, obviously, being being together for so long and, and the match is not going to get any easier so uh, yeah we'll see we'll see what happens we'll see what Kieran wants to do um, but yeah that's the, our first first two games are the, probably the most important two games of, of the World Cup at the, start, at the start yeah do you prefer it this way around with I think the order is New Zealand and then 
isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah. You prefer it that way around with those being your last two games instead of, for example, your first two games in the group stage? Um, yeah, I think I think that that will suit us. Uh, give us a bit of confidence. Obviously, if you if you do beat um, Namibia and Uruguay and play some good, convincing rugby, then it will give us more confidence to then come up against New Zealand and uh, and uh, in France we had the same in the previous World Cup. Uh, we had uh, Namibia and then Canada. And then we went up against the Springboks, uh, which we did play well for 45 minutes. Then we got the red card and it kind of just blew everything out of proportion. Um, but I, I prefer it that way. So you get, you can kind of build up into into uh, into those uh, New Zealand and, Fr- and French games. But as I said, like we're not taking the other games any lightly at all. We... We we ran close uh, ran close against Uruguay two years ago in Italy. So, and they beat they beat Fiji in the last World Cup. So we know they're not going to be a an easy team. They're going to be tough. They're going to be up for it. You you got to think like Namibia and Uruguay. They're going to target us as the as the as the upset game. So they're going to put everything they can against us. Um, so mm-hmm. it's gonna it's gonna be tough. It's it, we're not used to being uh, the favorites either in, in in those games. We haven't had that for. For many many times so it just depends on how the, the boys react to that as well it'll be, it'll be a different challenge yeah that's very interesting does this also mean that well from the new zealand perspective you're keeping an extra slightly closer eye on the rugby championship i don't know if you have managed to watch at all and yeah, if so, yeah, yeah, what, what have you made about well they seem to be peaking at the right time at the moment yeah, they, they look sharp i'm not gonna lie they look uh, they look very sharp they're very, they they're rotating the team a lot as well oh, yeah. um but they're yeah they're looking good they're looking slick the backs are looking really explosive um yeah it'll be it'll be it'll be it'll be interesting maybe they've peaked too early we never know <laughs> hopefully <laughs> they've peaked too hopefully they've peaked too early um but yeah now they've, they've still got a lot of games to play though like they've i don't know how many games i remember speaking to andre estes and um before we left for the for the world cup and sort of their preparations and stuff and i think they said they had like eight or nine games before the the World Cup starts something like that, which is which is crazy. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they manage and rotate and and use the squad um, in the right times to then peak at the World Cup. Can I ask who your starting ten would be from a New Zealand perspective? Because obviously they've kind of got this <laughs> this three way battle at the moment. D Mac yeah. when he was given the chance. Yeah, he's he's shy, he's good. Um, I think I don't know. I'd play all three of them to be honest. <laughs> find a way. Somehow, just play, to find a way to play all three because they're just so, they're so good. I think Richie Moyang has been playing really well, um, Super Rugby as well, and he's he's probably the one that can play just at fly half. Uh, whereas you get Bowden who can play at ten and fifteen. Yeah, it's a tough one. Honestly, I wouldn't want to be in the in the you know, coach's uh, shoes. I probably you'd probably play with one at ten and Bert and Barrett at fifteen. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, and then McKenzie's there as well. So it's <laughs> such a tough one because he's been playing so well too. Uh, but I think that's probably what they would do, and I I would do the same. We'll talk about Blooders Low later, but it'll be interesting to see who they go with because I think they've gone with two different 10-15 combinations so far. So it'll be interesting to see if they go yeah. McCarthy and Mawanga now. But we'll get to that yeah. in a um, in a little bit. I just want to cast your eye back to the Australia game in November, which you're obviously a massive part of. Is that your best memory in an Italy shirt? Uh, close to, yeah, probably one. It has to be top top three one moments. Uh, yeah, it was it was incredible. Uh, it was a great feeling. I think that stadium has a gives us a bit of luck. We beat South Africa there as well. Beat Georgia there. We haven't lost the game in that stadium now. I think we should move the Six Nations to, to Florence. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, might, it might help. Might help us out. Uh, no, it's yeah, hundred percent one of the best memories uh, for Italy. Uh, also beating Scotland and Murray Field in twenty fourteen. I think it was was yeah. was. Then obviously your first cap is always one of the best memories. Um, but yeah, but it was incredible. We, yeah, we 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 went in that game very confident as well. Like I know people didn't think we would do it, but when we turned up, then we thought, okay, we can we can beat Australia. We've got the players to do it. We've got the the game plan to do it. So we we were confident before the game even started. 
I'm sure a lot of people weren't, but um, yeah, man, we. No, it was it was nice to to do that and beat. I think it was the first time we beat Australia. Yeah, uh, in okay. Italy's history, so it was nice to be part of history as well. Describe as well, because you spoke eighteen months ago about the sort of when you were watching the Six Nations and you obviously weren't a part of it and how that was difficult, what it meant to all of a sudden be back at the forefront and also people spoke this time 18 months ago of the Italian revolution under Crowley and I'd imagine you didn't feel quite as much a part of it watching on the sidelines, obviously, as you probably did then by November. So how did it feel to all of a sudden be, okay, this is me, this is now, this is us? Yeah, when I uh, it was nice uh, when I when I walked into camp the first time I think it was in the summer it, it felt like I was it felt like I never left really uh, like I know the group was different but it was everybody was really welcoming uh, the whole culture of of the team is, was different everybody was on the same page we all enjoyed ourselves um, I, it was it was really good fun and and everybody was willing to learn. It was very uh, player driven. Everything was player driven, so we got a lot of responsibilities and ownership on us, which I think made all these young players grow a lot more and a lot quicker. Um, but yeah, uh, what Kieran's done for for Italian rugby has been massive. Um, started off a bit slow, maybe with the with the November, but um, he he was brave enough to just change the whole narrative and. Just throw throw away the old game plan and, and just bring a whole new thing and and we've embraced it and we we now we're playing to our strengths not just playing to what rugby is supposed to be played like we're playing to what we're good at and uh, it's it's so it's so much fun and yeah he's he's done he's done extremely well and uh, he has been repaying with a with a good World Cup. How surprised were you that um, that he didn't get offered the uh, the contract that he wanted uh, to match up? Yeah, it's uh, it's a tough, it's a it's a touchy subject. It's, we were, I was surprised he done so well, uh, but then it's it's sport, isn't it? It's, it's 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 a business in the end of the day. Like everybody changes clubs, everybody moves moves to different different countries, different different competitions. It's the same for coaches. Um, so yeah, we we were maybe a bit shocked at the start, but as soon as we got into into camp and into work it hasn't really been spoken about we know that we've got a job to do um, and yeah it gives us extra motivation maybe to to do a, a good job for him and and make him leave on a, on a high note do you, do you think that the confidence that he has instilled is something that will the confidence to play that you know attacking game <laughs> something that will stay with Italy um, after he's gone or do you think that it's um it could be a question of when he leaves that things change again. I feel like we've found our identity. We're going to, um, depending on obviously what, what uh, the new coach wants to do later, but I think we, as a group, this is what we want to do. Um, this is what we, we want to preserve this and, and, and improve this, this style of game that we, that we found, which suits us. Uh, we haven't been so competitive for, for so many years now, but, I think hopefully we can uh, we can come to some sort of a uh, solution after the World Cup, and obviously there's things we can we can improve and and can change, and and I'm sure the new coaching staff will will be wary of that. Um, but I feel like this is uh this is the way we play now, and it's our, it's in our DNA. It's our um yeah, it's what we we're, we're best at. So it would be a pity if we, if we don't carry on with that. Uh, we just got to see what happens um, after the World Cup. But hopefully we can we can keep a big chunk of this and then improve it because I'm not saying it's, this is, it's perfect. We can, you can always improve everything. Uh, and there's areas we can improve and we are improving now as well while we're in, in camp. Was there a moment where, I don't know, Kieran spoke to all of you about the fact that, you know, I don't know, this is, this is his end game and he, you know, he announced to you guys as well in camp and what was the general squad reaction to that? If that did happen. Uh, he did. He did let us know um, earlier, before it, it was announced. Um, unfortunately, we weren't in camp when it was announced because it was before our camps were even uh, had even started. So he did. He did. Uh, but he, he still spoke to us and just let us know. So we weren't 
uh, we didn't feel out so out of the blue and shocked by the news. So when it that when it did come out um, publicly, everybody knew knew already. And uh, well, yeah, we just like I said, we just need to move on from it. Uh, we don't want this to affect our World Cup. This is not. We don't want to think about this now. We want to focus on the job we've got at hand. And after the World Cup, then we can think about the the new coaching regime and what what's going to happen then and the. Uh, but I think we're everybody, especially Kieran, uh, he just wants to focus on, on this now and, and what, we, what we can do in the, in the following couple of months. Obviously, this is Kieran's last World Cup, well, only World Cup, last World Cup. Are you seeing this as potentially a last World Cup or are you just going to keep on until your body says no? I feel like I've got a few more years in me, uh, honestly. Um this these six weeks that do me really good the six weeks holiday uh, if you asked me six of uh, during the season last uh last season then i might have said no oh, this is definitely my last world cup but I, I feel i feel a lot better now i feel like i can just still give a lot to the team um yeah it's it's only four years isn't it so i'll be <laughs> I'll, I'll be i'll be 34 then you never know i've, I've seen it being done but i think i need to just See how this World Cup goes first. Um, I know it's going to be a new coaching regime as well, so a lot of things can change. I just want to. Oh, then after the World Cup, I want to go back to Perpignan and actually start playing with with Perpignan and, and give my all to them. And then I'll see how I feel. But um, I'm I'm not I'm not thinking about uh, hanging up the boots just yet. But I'll have to take it. Maybe consider taking a year by year or taking a block to two years to see how, how we do get to to 34 and and, uh, and another World Cup. But yeah, let's get to this one first. Well, by Johnny Sexton's logic, you've got two more World Cups in you. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, what's that? Australian America. It would be nice to play in America, but I don't think I'll be there, honestly. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask one more question. And I know we mentioned Paolo Odogwu already, but you probably know him a lot better well not a lot better but better than others know him having obviously played in the premiership with him how's he been other than position wise just how's he settled into camp have you spoken to him much has he spoken to you about the whole england thing at all he's a he's a great guy honestly like down to earth um really really a really nice person i actually shared a tent with him and uh in the army camp, it was me and him in the tents. Uh, so I got, I got, we got nice, close and personal. Uh, two man tent. Uh, yeah, no, he's he's an awesome guy. He's a, he's a very professional player as well. Um, he want you can see he wants to get better. Uh, we have I haven't asked him about the England thing really. Um, I just asked him a bit about wasps and and stad and now and how he's finding um, definitely in a Benetton as well now that he's moved there. Um, I feel like he's a, he's a great addition to our team. Obviously, like he's he's an X factor player. He's someone you'd rather play with and against. Um, and it's great to have him. It, it'll push the other players even more um, to to get better because you know there's a this stiff competition in every position and on the back line. So, which is only going to benefit uh, benefits us. And how's Dino Lamb doing? He was. Uh... Uh, another recruit. Yeah, I don't know if you had anything to do with that, Tommy, but um, yeah, he's been playing for a couple of years, Dino Lamb. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I need to give you a bit of permission here, but uh, yeah, no, he he's a great player to have as well. Like he can cover second row and and back row. Uh, he's a he's a pure athlete. He's just he's so strong, powerful, dynamic, um, and yeah, hundred percent. We it's nice to have him in, in this in this environment. Uh, Quite funny in the army camp, he was uh, he wasn't the best of uh, uh, best of moods because he was he didn't bring any hiking shoes. He had just a pair of plim soles. <laughs> and it was uh, like imagine a size forty seven or whatever, size fourteen plim soles, just going up mountains, climbing up rocks. So he's struggling a little bit there. And I told him, "Don't worry, mate. This is not what we're going to do every week. So just just buckle down, and then uh, once once you get to game time, you can see actually how, how fun it is and." I think he's been enjoying it. He's a uh, he's a great player, like I said, to have, and uh, yeah, I think he can he can also line out calls. So it's nice to have him as as an extra option, like jumping in the lineouts. Speaking of Quinn's players, I wanted to sort of ask about the England perspective of it as well. Um, 
we've Queen's players have been actually a bit of a topic of discussion. Alex Dombrandt was one in the Six Nations because obviously he had his chance to fill the boots of well the eight shirt effectively. Danny Kerr has obviously come back into the fold. Um, I wanted to ask about those two actually first of all. Uh, the general feeling from an English perspective was that Dombrandt didn't take his chance to the extent that he could have. And I wondered how he responded on a domestic level and within Quinn's camp to that potentially scrutiny. Well, I think whenever he puts on the Quinn's jerseys, he's one of the best players on, on, on the field. Um, he, he's one of the, the, the players that carries us. Um, I know when, after he came back from, from the Six Nations, he put his head down. He, he worked really hard. Uh, whenever he got the chance, he played He played really well for us. Um so sometimes those things maybe you can add as a motivation um, to, to, to get better, understand, okay, yeah. there's a difference between club level and international level, but yeah. it's, it's achievable. I think for, for someone like Domus, um, I think he's, he's got a lot of years in, in, inter, in international level. He's, he's a skillful player, he's powerful, he's strong, he's quick, he picks great lines. Um, so I think he's, yeah, I think he, a lot of like, especially in England, you get a lot of scrutiny. Um, even if you have a couple, of, if you make a couple of mistakes, everybody jumps on you, and it's not easy. Um, but that's how it is playing for for a team like England. Um, there's a lot of media attention. Sometimes you've got to put that to the side and, and just think, okay, what, what, what am I good at? Let's just focus on that and and make that a super strength of mine. And I think I'm excited to see him in in these warm up games, and I'm sure you'll you'll do well in the World Cup as well. You spent time in uh, South Africa, obviously, T Tommy. Um, I've always thought that the most brutal critics um, of any teams that I've come across are first South Africa <laughs> and second New Zealand. And yeah, I, I, the records yeah. maybe reflect that that that's um, you know that uh, demand for excellence is something that there is unrelenting with them. Do you think that sometimes England are? perhaps not quite on that same page, despite the criticism that some of the players get in the press? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, obviously, uh, South African press and, and, and media. It's, it's, it is tough. Uh, you can just see the comments whenever South Africa loses. It's, yeah. it's just the one. You need to filter everything, honestly. Um, I think, uh, well, England had a great World Cup in 2019, and then kind of dipped a little bit. So maybe that's why the, there's a lot more media media scrutiny, media attention, because uh, well, we, we did so well in the World Cup. Why aren't we performing again like we did in 2019? And it, But the thing is, it's you got to take these things in cycles. Sometimes you do have a, a bad year. Um, like no one's perfect. Uh, players do make mistakes. You can't always be peaking at the right time. Um, you just got to hopefully do it as much as possible. Uh, but I feel like England have... Have the players, have the the resources, have the coaching staff to to do really well at every tournament. Um, like you, I think it's the the like the in, is it in England that there's the most uh, players playing rugby in in the whole world that kind of thing. Like you got yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, have, you have such a big pool of of players to choose from. Um, so. You just got to hope. Like, obviously, there's a lot of new players playing together. Um, so you, in that need to gel. Everybody comes from there's well, there, there was 12, 13 Premiership clubs. Now there's ten Premiership clubs. So everybody comes from different different places. So you got to get that chemistry going and and get the those partnerships working as well. So um, I, I feel like they will they will have a good World Cup. They'll they'll be they'll be ready to go. They've been training hard. I know they were in Verona uh, two weeks ago. In the, in the heats training, uh, I spoke to a few of the Quinn's boys saying, like, how, how the hell do you guys train in this weather? Is they get it right, or should they have been going high? Like, uh, like high. It, it depends, it depends what you want to do, really. Like, you can either do heat heat training or high altitude training. So, uh, we chose we chose that, but don't, don't get me wrong, it was, it was still like 30 degrees, so it wasn't, it wasn't uh, cold whatsoever. Okay, I just wanted yeah. to ask about, um, I don't know if you're if you've spoken to Caden since the England squad was released and what you make of that decision. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't spoken to him, but I, honestly, I don't understand 
no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't usually have opinions. I like, I don't want to give opinions on these things, but I don't understand how Caden hasn't isn't in the team. How he hasn't been capped yet for for England. Um, he's he's been the out and out or Premiership top scorer was it for the last two years now. Um, he's he's been he won, he's been our best player for the last two years at Quinns. He's just he's just a really uh, strong, powerful finisher. He just he just scores tries and yeah, I don't understand how he's not getting a nod. Um, honestly, uh, from from Steve. Um, yeah, I'm gut, I'm gutted for him because I think he he deserves a shot and and if he does get a shot, he'll show how good he is because honestly, I, I was blown away by him. Um, when I when I went to Quinns. Uh, hopefully he can get he can get a he can get a shot. It's still it's still not set in stone. They haven't picked thirty three. Um, anything can happen. Injuries happen. So if he does get his chance, I think he's going to take it with both hands because he's been waiting for it and he he deserves it. Brendan, I'm guessing that's your feeling about the Murley thing as well. Yeah, and I've always been really impressed. Um, he, he ticks every box, uh, not least defensively. He, he's one of the best tackling wings I've seen for a long time. It, it seemed like his time, but you know, selection is very difficult. Steve Borthwick knows what he wants. He has a plan, and for some reason, Caden Murley's not in it. But it's a bit mystifying. Um, before we just move on from Italy, I, I did want to compliment them on one thing: these um, these summer warm up matches. You know, they're, they're necessary. The squads need them, but they they can be a little bit Moorish, and it, it always irks me a little bit that the home unions like try and. Um, milk it a bit, all the big stadiums, try and fill them, quite pricey tickets. And I've noticed that Italy are playing their last two matches of the warm-ups. Um, the third match of, of their four is in San Bernadetto del Tronto, which I know it'll be actually, which is a beautiful, not beautiful, it's a, it's a really nice resort, Adriatic resort. It's a bit like the Mediterranean, not rugby country. It's in the Marche, 13,000 stadium. But what a great event for that area to bring in the Italy team, that's the way to use these matches. And then the last match against Japan, which is obviously a really good match, um, is back at Treviso, you no, know, the absolute heartbeat of Italian rugby, 9,000 capacity, I think it is, the morning go. Morning go. Yeah. Um, but Brit, what a thank you. What a great thank you to that rugby community there to bring that Italy match there. And I, I just sort of commend Italy totally for using two of their four matches, in fact, both their home matches, rather than trying to make, maximise revenue maximize money actually fly the flag in one region which isn't a rugby area and one region which is totally a rugby area so well done to Italy for that I yeah, know it's it is great it's nice to we can we can try and spread the sport a little bit we've played in some of it twice already um the previous World Cup preparation against uh, Russia I think we played there and then a, a little bit earlier against Samoa so We've had we've had good memories there. It's, it's a great place to go, and there's always a big turnout anyway, even though it's not like you said a, a rugby mad area of Italy. Um, and yeah, Treviso is like as as a, any anyone knows, it's, uh, it's where rugby is formed really in Italy. And I know that game's been sold out for for months now, but yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, only yeah. nine nine thousand seats, so but it will be nice to get a, uh, get it full packed, and it'll, it'll still be a good atmosphere. And that'll be a great week for you guys in camp. There'll be such a great atmosphere there all week. You know, that that is a proper send-off to the World Cup, as that, yeah. you know, as far as I'm concerned. 100%, I agree. Tommy, I've just got one more question for you, and it's just on the England front. Um, we're going to go and discuss the England squad, but I won't um, ask you to hang around for that. I'll let you go and recover from your, from your difficult training day. But who would be your starting 10 for England? Yeah. I know in the Six Nations, you said Marcus Smith. <laughs> And he, yeah, obviously he did get his chance, but I wondered whether that you were still backing your Queens boy. I'm always going to back my Queens boy. I'm always going to back Marcus. Uh, it's going to be a tough, tough selection. Like, just like for for New Zealand, uh, with three quality tens. You the same with England, three quality tens. Um, uh. Faz and, and, and Forty are very very similar. Um and then Marcus gives you something different. I'm always gonna back my, my Quinn's teammate. Uh, um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. I know I know Borthwick had a lot of um success with, with uh Forty as well at ten with with, with Tigers. And uh, and then you got Faz who's, who's captain as well and he's been playing 
incredible rugby for the, the the last bit of the season as well. So yeah, it's going to be a really interesting one. Um, I'll keep a close eye on that. Um, I, I spoke to Marcus a few, when he was in Verona, and then I, I congratulated him on his uh, on his new signing, on his renew, renewal at uh, the Harlequins. Um, so now hopefully, hopefully he gets the nod. And I know if he does, you'll, you'll tear up because he's a, he's a quality player and he's a he's a one one of a one of a kind really. Things he can do, not not many other people can. So hopefully he can he can replicate that in a in the English show as well. I guess your sort of ideal world would be a quarter final or semi final showdown opposite Marcus Smith for in, against England, wouldn't it? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I, 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 was it ten minutes against against him um, in Very Twickenham? Good. Yeah, so uh, it would be nice to get a, a few more. Uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be awesome. It'll be nice to to get that get that match up going. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. One game at a time, as the cliche always says. Yeah, of course. Well, hopefully we do see you guys in that quarterfinal. Um, Tommy, it's been great to have you back again. Uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, all the best for, well, this this Saturday, all the pre, all the pre-World pre Cup games. Um, and yeah, go well in Paris. Well, I Thank will be you. in Paris, so maybe I'll bump into you there. Perfect. So I look forward to that. Thank, thanks for having you guys again. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Cheers, Tommy. Tommy. Take care. Ciao, ciao. Uh, ciao. Shall we look at the... so? The England score, we kind of touched upon it. Um, Nick, I want it. I'm sure you have something to say about the omission of Val Rapava Ruskin. So I may as well just hand hand the microphone to you on that. Look, it, it's very it, it's very difficult to gainsay what's going on in a six week, you know, over a six week training camp. But it is interesting that Rapava Ruskin managed to force his way in at long last. Um, and was, you know, was obviously included right the way through until, you know, what, a, a day or so ago. So um, it's surprising. The thing about him that impresses me is that he's not only a very, very sound scrummager, he is the best turnover forward, certainly front five turnover forward that there is in England at the moment. So... Winning turnovers is a critical part of the modern game, and um, and and England have decided that he's for some reason uh, not up to the mark. I would say that he's better at that than Joe Marler. Joe Marler is a very experienced and very good scrummager, um, but you know Joe's been in and out of the England team. He said, you know, he's talked about you know, looking Steve Borthwick in the eyes and sort of saying, you know, um, uh, you know, wanting his his definite stamp of approval that he wants him and that he's going to get a fair a fair crack of the whip in selection. Well, marla has got that. Um, you know, some people would say that Joe's sort of blown hot and cold with England. There's 100,000 quid on the line at the World Cup. And, uh, you know, players are motivated by that. And I'm not just saying he would be the only one, but certainly players are motivated by that sort of windfall. Um, Rapava Ruskin looks as if he may he may miss out unless there are injuries. Bevan Rod, I think, um, you know, I've been critical of his scrummaging in particular, um, but I was very impressed with him in the latter part of the season in Sale's run to the final. He's a very good rugby player. Um, he's also wins turnovers. He's not as prolific in that regard as uh, Rapava Ruskin, but he's quite dynamic on the ball. So it's a fierce competition there. I just wish there was that sort of competition on the tight head side of the, the, the scrum, which looks uh, pretty ordinary. The It's been a confusing England squad, hasn't it? Because, well, we were just saying off air that it's been cut down so many times that we're kind of just waiting for the 33 and it still hasn't come. Um, Brendan, is this saying for you then that the the sort of omissions of, well, Merlin and Rapapa Ruskin in particular, because that was very recent, but also Alex Mitchell and Zach Mercer, for example, which we haven't spoken about are not necessarily nails in coffins? It's very difficult to tell. I mean, the process, I think, is part of the process of making camp really competitive. You know, there's a, this drip, drip, drip of players being cut. And you can imagine it, it can all be a bit edgy 
in training when it's like that. And that's probably what Borthwick wants. Having said that, you know, I refuse to believe that Zach Mercer really can't be part of that England squad. So a bit of me thinks that perhaps there will be a surprise recall, you know, when you get to the 33, perhaps, you know, when it really comes to that crunch moment when they sit down for the big selection meeting. And I think perhaps one or two names like Zach Mercer might come back into it. I'd also really quite like to see Ben Spencer looked at again at, at Scrum Half. Um, Brent, and it is all that Evan Rod seems to have gone Brent, out and come back in. Brent, I think you're, I, I just don't see, I mean, I, I think that the whole process loses credibility if that actually happens. You know, I mean, particularly with, with Mercer and Spencer, who were dropped so early in the proceedings, <laughs> bring them back now would just be, it, it would be extraordinary. Oh, I'm not saying there'd be anything logical about that, but I can see it happening. <laughs> We're talking about selection. Well, you know, there's only what there's there's a, selection the only selection that matters is the right selection, isn't it? Really, and you know, we've seen players. You know, well, Ireland always have a couple of big injuries. For example, on the eve of the World Cup, you always get somebody brought into Ireland squads. Uh, so it could happen, but it, it has been a you know, it was such a big squad to, st squad to start off with, and this sort of cleaving off of two or three players every week has been quite a painful process to watch. But then also the introduce, introduction of some players who've been resting because they're involved in domestic finals late May, early June, they're introduced after some players who they were contesting against for their position have been junked, have been mm. dropped. So it's been pretty confusing, if I'm honest. Um, but was you know the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. If he selects a belt in 33 man squad and they get to the final, this will all be a bit academic. Mm. Well, I guess that that's 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 always the uh, the sort of cliff edge that we walk. Yeah, right? <laughs> But um, look, um, that's what we get paid for. I, I'm I, I I don't see anything. At the moment, I mean, I, I wait to see what happens in these warm-up games. One thing that I am clear about is that this, you know, the warm-up games are usually pretty ho-hum. It, it, it's, you know, before the Lord Mayor show and nobody really gives too much of a damn. There are one or two, you know, if you look back in the past, there have been one or two selection conundrums. Now he's got the best part of 15 selection conundrums. Mm. Or 23 selection conundrum yeah. because there is no real form for this team. They, you, you know, they they didn't click um, and and hit the ground running in the Six Nations. One of the things that does, you know, is is important here is that Steve Borthwick has actually been around these players or certainly the core of them for a very long time. You know, I mean, he had. He had the four years going into the 2019 World Cup with uh, with Jones. So he knows the territory around quite a lot of these players. And it seems to me that his selection is becoming um, or is looking as if it might become increasingly conservative. And this fast, you know, re real quick fire game that he was aspiring to when b before the start of the Six Nations, uh, that he may have rode back on that a bit. Um, because he, he perhaps recognises that he hasn't got the players to do it. I find the two um, aged scrum halves a, 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 a head scratcher. Um, I don't, you know, we we assume that it will be on the basis of what happened in the end, towards the end of the season, although Owen Farrell did not have a great Six Nations, that his form for Saracens will put him in pole position at fly half. But so much about England depends on that hinge, um, on whether he manages to get a back row that could match what the kamikaze kids uh, did in 2019. He certainly got a, a number of very, very good players. Does, you know, does Tom Pearson sort of light up the stage? Does Jack Willis really put his, his stamp on the team? You know, what is going to happen at, at, at number eight? Um, you know, the whole thing is in a state of total flux. <laughs> it was that <out> flux? <laughs> flux, yeah. Flux. <laughs> I mean, but take Scrum R, for example. Now, now, so you've got two oldies um, in Youngs and Danny Care in. So that's two of the three Scrum Rs. Say, and we don't wish it for one minute, say one of those gets a, an injury which prevents him going for the World Cup. 
which way do you go then? Are they in the squad because they're old heads, experienced heads, and do you therefore bring in somebody like Spencer? Or is the next on the uh, the taxi rank, is that Alex Mitchell, who is an entirely different player uh, in, in many ways? So I don't see the logic of the two being in the squad in the first place. And I, I struggle to see what will happen if one of them gets injured. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm with you there. Um, it is, you know, it is a, it is a, 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 a very, a huge bank of experience. But I don't think that either of them had great seasons um, this this last season. And when you look at the best scrum halves in the world, when you look at a guy like Dupont and the way, I mean, he listen, he is exceptional. Uh, but the way that France gave him his head very, very early on, um, and he has, you know, he's picked up the ball and run with it and um, ever since. And I, I just feel that we always sit on players a, a bit too long. Spencer hasn't been sat on, you know, I suppose he's been he's been squashed more than sat on. You know, he's never really had a chance, but from being jetted in for you know, the final of the 2019 World Cup. Well, if he got jetted in again for another five minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's in his rugby's um, failings, it's conundrums, just there in selection all the time. And Borthwick's real challenge is to identify a team actually now. Um, you know, forget about the, the opening game against Wales. He should know now what is uh, is starting 23 years. It's, it's very, very important in many ways that he does because the time for experimentation really in many ways is through. He should go in knowing what is, is, is best 23 years and really, apart from the, a, a tweak here and there throughout the, uh, the, you know, the four games coming up, maybe he can take a punt against Fiji, but... Um, Certainly, the 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 double header against Wales and uh, and against Ireland. He really knows what needs to know what he's trying to achieve, and England need to go out and achieve it before the World Cup starts. Get a, get ahead of steam. It's interesting. You, you take someone like Henry Arundel, who I think Borthwick is on board with. I think he thinks he's a major talent. I've seen a couple of very glowing mentions in the last six weeks, but he hasn't had a lot of rugby. He hasn't had a lot of Test rugby. No. He's one of those ones who really needs. At least two, if not three, starts of these four warm-up matches. He needs ball in hand. He needs lots of. Um, he needs to to work things out defensively. He needs to score a couple of tries. He needs to get his try scoring mojo. So uh, this is a big series of matches for somebody like him. Uh, Pearson as well. If he's convinced by Tom Pearson, and I think Tom Pearson's a great player, uh, slightly different dynamic to the England back row. He is an out and out carrier. You know, so England would have to incorporate that out and out carrier in the back row, but he, he needs two or three starts if he, if, that, if that is the way that England are going to go, and they want him in their starting fifteen. You he, he, he can't just start him from scratch in the World Cup. He needs a, you know, he probably the island match, at least one of the island matches and one of the Wales matches, starting and staying on for eighty minutes. Yeah, he's totally green at international level. That's, yeah. the, you know, he's played at the at the next level down and made quite an impact, but. You know, we know it's a different beast, and um, you know, God willing, he 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 does make that impact at Test level. But um, it's a big call, yeah. and you know, there are just it's a it's yet another another one of the conundrums. Um, so you know, England have got a lot. You know, I think Bort Borthwick has accepted it and said it. England have got a lot of ground to make up very very quickly. And it should have started during this six weeks training. They should be ready to hit the ground, you know, really hard against Wales. Well, Wales is August 5th, isn't it? And then the World Cup squad is the official World Cup squad is announced two days later on August 7th. So really, it's only that one game that he has to actually nail down who he wants and when he wants them. I was going to say, if he has real you know, real conviction in the players. He would announce that World Cup squad before the Wales game. Yeah. I think what you said about the scrum halves particularly is very emblematic of the fact that the sort of fast-paced game represented by the inclusions of an Alex Mitchell or a Rafi Quirk or even a Ben Spencer has been retconned slightly. So, yeah, remains to be seen. I'm guessing you and you men will be watching every single qualifying game when we get there. 
Oh yes, oh yes, try stopping us. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one other comment about the, these um, summer games. I think I'm right in saying so. Like in the World Cup history, there's been one win from the Northern Hemisphere. Every other win has been sub- Southern Hemisphere. Now, what's different there? The Southern Hemisphere, certainly in the modern era since '95, have always had the Tri Nations or the Rugby Championship in the summer. They go into the World Cup off the back of a tournament, battle-hardened. And what was the one exception to that? England, 2003. And what did England do in 2003? They went on one of the toughest short tours ever. They beat New Zealand away. They beat Australia away for the first time in their history. And they beat a test-strength New Zealand Maori, all in the space of about 12 days. So that, to me, is the ideal preparation for World Cup. Um and, you know, how can you replicate that in the, these warm-up matches? You can't, but you've got to try. England have certainly got to try this summer to make their matches that, that important. Brent, Brent there's, a, there's, there's a very interesting dynamic here, and that is, is that you've got, in both England and Wales, you've got two teams who are, you know, who are really looking for, for, for a new dawn, a new identity. So that makes these warm-up games. I, I don't just see them as being, you know, turn and turn about. I mean, normally you, in the warm-up games, you see them, you know, they might change. Um, you might bring the entire bench, you, you know, oh. on after about, you know, 45 minutes or whatever else, turning the turning the thing, goddamn thing into a lottery. So I, I don't quite see that this, this time round. I mean, I think that these games really matter. Um, you know, I think you're right. I think England have got to make the matter, and they do matter. I think I think the England warm up. Well, I think actually. Wales have to as well. That's yeah, the yeah. No That'd be way. worth watching that that that, that double header definitely. I mean, Gat- what Warren Gatland will be wanting Wales to make every bit as much of a statement as you know as as England fans want uh, from from Borthwick's England. You know, I mean, I think that these that the, these warm up are warm up games with a difference. And I think the same applies to England going to Dublin as well, because we've got a, a recent yardstick of, of of England in Dublin. It was the last game, I think, of the Six Nations, and it's the last game of this uh, of this warm up state. It's not the last game; it's the penultimate game. But um, I think that these three games do, do they will matter? They will matter. Then they will inform us quite clearly of how these sides. Um, will will be in in the opening stages of the World Cup. They do seem yeah. to carry a particular Welsh and English meaning that they don't have elsewhere. Brenda, did you have something to say? Uh, no, no, I just about to agree with Nick there. You know, the, and it almost I think almost proves my point. You know, you need that rugby in the summer leading into the World Cup to be really meaningful. And in a lot of the time, the Northern Hemisphere teams have lacked that, and it's mm-hmm. shown. But certainly, the double header against Wales and the Ireland match will be extremely meaningful matches for England and and indeed certainly Wales in the Ireland's a slightly odd one, doesn't it? Ireland have got almost it's almost like a lose lose, really. You know, they can get injured players. They, their reputation couldn't be higher in many ways. Uh, a defeat would be a little bit of a, a hit to self confidence. They might want to rest a few of the players. They have like they won't have Johnny Sexton. I think it'd be quite tricky to, you know, to navigate some of Ireland's warm-up matches, whereas England will be eyeballs out and probably Wales as well. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, the only thing <laughs> the only thing that I'd say, you know, again that to a degree, is that Ireland are in, are in the half of the draw the, <laughs> where they absolutely have got to hit the ground running, you know. Yeah, so that, yeah. I'm, uh, I, I sort of think that the warm-ups are going to are gonna give us a great deal more competitive edge than they normally do uh, because players those players that will be selected are also very much playing for places you know they're playing for places in a world cup um there 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 are not, very few of them nailed on well we've got one more episode until England's World Cup warm-up start. We'll be having Willie Anderson on um on Monday at 10 a.m. to have a look at Ireland. Um We've run out of time, so just a brief, brief nod towards the Bled, uh, first Bledisloe Cup game of the Rugby Championship this weekend. Eddie Jones has been talking his usual... Um, I'm not going to say anything rude. Just talking in you in, in his usual form. Uh, do either of you men see anything other than an all-black win this weekend? Uh, 
No, I think New Zealand are on quite a good roll at the moment. I, I think Australia might play quite a bit better, but uh, no, New Zealand. I think I predicted New Zealand for the the, the abbreviated rugby championship. I can't remember now. Chris yeah. Stewart, I'm sure, will remind us of all the predictions. <laughs> As long as as long as we'll be wrong. <laughs> but, um, look, I um now look, I I don't um I don't see there, there's something there's something um he he left England on a low. He has not managed to pick Australia up, despite some of their players playing extremely well in other other says like Skelton and so on and so forth um and uh, you know it's in Sydney and it's a huge game and I agree with Brent Australia I'd be surprised if Australia do not raise their game significantly but to beat New Zealand at the moment when you look at the form, the form that Australia have shown in the op opening two games it would be a real um, it would be a real upset, uh, and I don't see it happening. I, I'm not sure that Jones has got this, you know, he, he with England, when he first came in, he had this real sort of groundswell, players who really wanted to win something. Um, I, I don't I don't get the feeling that he's got this Australian team, you know, at a high peak, really. Not yet, anyway. No. And maybe not at all. No, but that's his discourse, isn't it? Is that we've got a they haven't hit rock bottom yet, and they've got to hit rock bottom to be able to progress or something like that. So he's obviously playing the that's an interesting played, theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Either they hit rock bottom and bounce back, or they stink. I thought losing to South Africa twos away first up was probably rock bottom, wasn't it? I mean, the the, the weird thing is, is that. They do have some very good players. Yeah, you know, they do. Always do. But whether they believe in 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 Eddie, trust in Eddie is another is another matter. There's already a great deal of scepticism about him in some quarters in Australia, and that will be building unless they build, beat the All Blacks. So there's a hell of a lot of incentive. Let's put it that way. High stakes. We're getting to that stage where every game will have high stakes leading up to this World Cup. Um, guys, we've run out of time. We'll wrap yeah. up there. Uh, but yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys with Willie Anderson on Monday. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe through our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.